chapter thirty six of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter thirty six under fairer auspices knowing now what i had to expect from parson chowne and from all his train whether clothed or naked and even perhaps from parson jack who lay beneath his thumb so much and who could thrash me properly i seized the chance of a good high tide and gave a man sixpence to help me and warped the rose of devon to a berth where she could float and swing and nobody come anigh her without a boat or a swimming bout because i knew from so many folk what a fiend i had to deal with and that his first resort for vengeance haply through his origin generally was to fire they told me that when he condescended to do duty in either church for two he had as i may have said all the farmers took it for a call to have their ricks burned they durst not stay away from church to save the very lives of them nor could they leave their wives behind on account of the unclothed people all they could hope was that no offence had come from their premises since last service the service he held just as suited his mood sometimes three months and the church door locked sometimes three sundays one after the other man woman and child demanded whenever this happened the congregation knew that the parish had displeased him and that he wanted them all in church while his boy was at the stackyards he never deigned to preach but made the prayers themselves a comedy singing them up to the clerk's amen and the neigh of his mare from the vestry i cannot believe even half that i hear from the very best authority therefore i set nothing down which may be over-coloured but the following story i know to be true because seven people have told it to me and not any two very different two or three bishops and archdeacons or deacons of arches i know not which at any rate high freemasons desired to know some little more about a man in their jurisdiction eminent to that extent and equally notorious they meant no harm at all but just to take a little feel of him because he had come to visitation once or twice when summoned with his huntsman and his hounds and himself in leathern breeches there must have been something amiss in this or at any rate they thought so and his lordship a bishop just appointed made up his mind to tackle him he came in a coach and four and wearing all his high canonicals and they managed somehow to get up the hill and appear at nympton rectory then a footman struck the door with a gold stick well embossed and he struck again and he struck again more in dudgeon every time because no man had yet been seen nor woman on the premises only dogs very wild and mad but kept away from biting strike again said his lordship nodding under his wig with some courtesy we must never be impatient jemmy strike again my lad jemmy struck a thundering stroke and out came mrs steelyard she looked at them all and then she said with her eyes full on the bishops are you robbers or are you savages my master is in that state and you do this and they all saw that she could not weep by reason of too much sorrow it is the lord bishop said the footman keeping a little away from her excellent female began his lordship spreading his hands in a habit learned according to his duties tell your master that his jehoshaphat wishes to see him mr jehoshaphat she replied you are just in time and no more sir how we have longed for a minister you are just in time and no more sir will you have the kindness to come this way and to step as quietly as you can his lordship liked not the look of this being however a resolute man he followed the stony woman up the staircase and into a bedroom with the window curtains three-quarters drawn 
and here he found a pastille burning and a lot of medicine bottles and a bible on the table open and on it a pair of spectacles in the bed lay some one with a face of fire heavily blotched with bungs of black and all his body tossing with spasms and weak groaning what means this asked his lordship drawing considerably nearer to the door only the plague said the stony woman he was took with it yesterday doctor says he may last two hours more almost particular if he can get anybody to take the symptoms off him i expect to be down with it some time to-night because i feel the tingling but your highness will stop and help us i am damned if i will cried the bishop sinking both manners and dignity in the violence of alarm and he ran down the stairs at such a pace that his apron strings burst and he left it behind and he jumped into the coach with his two feet foremost and slammed up the windows and ordered full speed then parson chowne rose and threw off his mask and drew back the window curtain and sat in his hunting clothes and watched with his usual bitter smile the rapid departure of his foe and he had the bishop's apron framed and hung it in the parsonage hall from a red deer's antlers with the name and date below and so of that bishop he heard no more now a man who had beaten three bishops and all the archdeacons in the country was of course tenfold of a match for me and when he rode down smoothly to me as he did in a few days time and never touched on our little skirmish except with a sort of playful hit so far as his hardy mind could play and riding another horse without a word about the mischief which his favourite mare had taken and demanded as a matter of justice that having quitted his service now i should pay back seven and sixpence drawn in advance for wages i was obliged to touch my hat as if i had never made stroke at his or put my knee upon him he had flogged me to such purpose that i ever must admire him for the flick of the boatswain's lash was a tickle compared to what chowne took out of me and if i must tell the whole truth i was prouder of having knocked down such a wonderful man than of all my victories put together but one of my weak and unreasonable views of life is this that having thrashed a man i feel a great power of good will to him and a desire to give him quarter and the more so the less he cries for it but on the whole i was not so young after all that was said by everybody as to imagine for a moment that i had felt the last of him the very highest in the land had been compelled to yield to him as when he turned out my lord g s horses from the stabling ordered at lord g s inn would such a man accept defeat from a crazy old mariner like me feeling my danger and meaning never to knock under any more i refused as a matter of principle to restore so much as a halfpenny and if i understand law at all he was bound to give me another week's wages in default of notice however i could not get it and therefore am glad to quit such trifles from all experience it was known that this man never hurried vengeance he knew that he was sure to get it and he liked to dwell upon it thus prolonging his enjoyment by the means of hope he loved as in the case of that unfortunate captain vellicott to persuade his enemies that he had forgiven or at least forgotten them and then to surprise them and laugh to himself at their ignorance of his nature so i felt pretty sure that i had some time till my life would be in danger for of course he knew that my fairy business growing in profit daily would keep me within his reach for the present over and above the difficulty of getting across the channel now however he began upon me sooner than i expected on account perhaps of my low degree but in the meanwhile feeling sure that i could not stand worse with him than i did desiring moreover to ease my conscience and perhaps improve my income by an act of justice i crossed the river to narnton court and getting among the servants nicely sent word in to miss isabel carey that the old ferryman begged leave to see her upon business most particular 
for of course although in the hurry of things i may have forgotten to mention it the lovely young lady i ferried across and whose name i was thrashed so for not betraying was captain drake's sweetheart the ward of sir philip one of the most hateful things in chowne was that he never did anything in the good old-fashioned manner unless it were use of the horsewhip and it now rejoiced my heart almost to be shown into a fine dark room by the side of good long passages with a footman going before me and showing legs of a quite superior order and then under my instructions boldly throwing an oaken door wide and announcing mr david llewellyn ma'am for though i had left felix farley behind from a sort of romantic bashfulness i had seen in the hall a coloured gentleman who seemed justly popular therefore i had just dropped a hint not meant to go any further concerning my risk of life and fortitude for the sake of black men and this made the women admire me for it turned out that this worthy negro stood high in the house and had saved some cash the room which i entered was large and high with an amazing number of books in it and smelling exceeding learned and there in a deep window sat the young lady with the light from the river glancing on the bright elegance of her hair and when she rose and came towards me i felt uncommonly proud of having been even thrashed for her sake nor did i wonder at captain drake's warm manner of proceeding or at chowne's resolve to keep so jealous a watch over her over and above her beauty which was no business of mine of course she had such pretty eyebrows and so sweet a way of looking that a thrill went to my experienced heart in spite of all experience and women seemed a different thing from what i was accustomed to therefore i left her to begin while i made bows and felt afraid of giving offence by gazing she however put me at my ease almost directly having such a high-bred way so clarified and gentle that i neither could be distant nor familiar with her only to be quite at ease like respect and love her and this lady was only about seventeen it is wonderful how they learn so much i need not follow all i said or even what she said to me without for a moment sacrificing my true sense of dignity i gave her to understand very mildly that i had seen something and had taken a vague sense of its import when i chanced to be after wild ducks also that strong attempts had been made to set me spying after her and that i might have yielded to them but for my own lofty sense of being a victorious veteran and the way in which i was conquered by her extraordinary beauty she seemed for a moment to doubt how far i should have touched that subject and if i had only looked up she would have rung the bell decidedly but i bowed and kept down my eyelashes which were grey now and helped me much in paying innocent compliments to every kind of woman even in the bar of very first-rate public houses have i been pressed to take and not pay for glasses even of ancient stingo because of the way i have paid respects and looked through my shadows afterwards therefore this young lady said i hardly know what to do or say mr llewellyn it is a strange tale why should any one watch me that is more than i can say my lady i only know that the thing is done and by a very wicked man indeed and you have found it out as ferryman how clever of you to be sure and how honest to come and tell me you have been a royal sailor in the royal navy man our captains are the most noble men so brave and glorious and handsome if you could only see one of them perhaps i have she said under her breath being carried away by my description as i hoped to do to her and then she came back through a shading of colours to herself and looked at me as if to say have you detected me now i touched my lock and by no means seemed to have dreamed a suspicion of anything you are a most worthy man she said and wonderfully straightforward none but a royal navy sailor could have behaved so nobly 
in spite of all the bribes offered you no 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 i cried nothing to speak of nothing to speak of what is a guinea and a half a week when it touches a man's integrity three guineas a week you shall have at once because you have behaved so nobly and because you have fought for your country so and been left with nothing i think you said with half of your lungs quite shot away except tuppence a day to live upon one and eightpence farthing a week my lady and to be signed by a clergyman and twenty-eight miles to walk for it it vexes me so to hear such things don't tell me any more of it what is the use of having money except for the people who want it mr llewellyn you must try not to be offended i saw that there was something coming but looked very grave about it a man of my rank and mark must never be at all ready and much less eager to lay himself under any form of trifling obligation and thoroughly as she had won me over i tried very hard not to be offended while she was going to a small black desk if she had come thence with a guinea or two my mind was made up to do nothing more than gracefully wave it back again and show myself hurt at such ignorance of me but now when she came with a five-pound note such as sir philip seemed to keep in stock my duty to bardie and bunny rose as upright as could be before my eyes and overpowered all selfish niceties i would not make a fuss about it lest i might hurt her feelings but placed it in my pocket with a bow of silent gratitude perhaps my face conveyed to her that it was not the money i cared for only to do what was just and right as any british sailor must when delicately handled also her confidence in me was so thoroughly sweet and delicate that i felt the whole of my heart wrapped up in saving her from her enemies we made no arrangements about it but i went into her service bodily being left to my own discretion as seemed due to my skill and experience i was to keep the ferry going because of the opportunities as well as to lull suspicion and always at dark i was bound to be according to my own proposal near the river front of the house to watch against all wicked treachery and especially if a spy of chowns should come sneaking and skulking there whether in a boat or out of it i gladly volunteered to thrash him within an inch of his foul base life the bad man's name never passed between us and indeed i may say that the lady forbore from committing herself against anybody so that i was surprised to find such wit in one so youthful we settled between us that my duties were to begin that very day and my salary of course to run also how the lady was to let me know when wanted and i to tell her when i discovered anything suspicious and as i had been compelled to restore the parson's gun to his gunmaker miss carey led me to a place you might almost call an armory and bade me choose any piece i liked and her own maid should place it where i could find it that same evening as though it were to shoot wild fowl for them but she advised me on no account to have any talk with nanette or any servants of the household whether male or female not only because of the wicked reports and cruel slanders prevailing but also that it might not be known how i was to act in her interest and then having ordered me a good hot dinner in the butler's pantry as often was done for poor people she let me go once and then called me back and said oh nothing and then called me again and said looking steadily out of the window by the by i have quite forgotten to say that there is a boat belonging to a ship commanded by a son of sir philip bampfylde a white boat with three oars on each side and sometimes an officer behind them if they should happen to come up the river or to go ashore upon business here you need not i mean you will quite understand that no harm whatever is intended to me and therefore that you may you see what i mean to be sure to be sure my lady of course i may quit my duty so long as there is a man-of-war's boat in the river even the boldest and worst of men would venture nothing against you then 
quite so she replied looking bravely round with as much of pride in her bright blue eyes as of colour on her soft fresh cheeks so i made my best bow and departed End of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter thirty seven two poor children by this time i owe it to all the kind people who have felt some pity for our bardie and her fortunes to put off no longer a few little things which i ought to tell them in the first place they must not think of me but look upon me as nobody treat me in fact as i treat myself and never ask what i knew just now and what i came to know afterwards only to trust me as now they must to act in all things honourably and with no regard to self and not only that but with lofty feeling and a sense of devotion towards the members of the weaker sex captain drake bampfylde was the most unlucky of born mortals to begin with he was the younger son of that very fine sir philip and feeling that he had far more wit and enterprise than his elder brother while thankful to nature for these endowments he needs must feel amiss with her for having mismanaged his time of birth now please to observe my form of words i never said that he did so feel i only say that he must have done so unless she had made him beyond herself which from her love for us she hardly ever tries to do however he might have put up with that mistake of the goddess that sits cross-legged i have heard of her i can tell you and a ship named after her though to spell her name would be a travail to me fatal perhaps at my time of life i mean to say at any rate that young drake bampfylde might have managed to get over the things against him and to be a happy fellow if he only had common luck but providence having gifted him with unusual advantages of body and mind and so forth seemed to think its duty done and to leave him to the devil afterwards this is a bad way of beginning life especially at too young an age to be up to its philosophy and the only thing that can save such a man is a tremendous illness or the downright love of a first-rate woman thence they recover confidence or are brought into humility and get a bit of faith again as well as being looked after purely and finding a value again to fight for after abandoning their own not that drake bampfylde ever did slip into evil courses so far as i could hear of him or even give way to the sense of luck and abandon that of duty i'm only saying how things turn out with nineteen men out of twenty in spite of chances he may have happened just to be the twentieth i know for sure that he turned up well though vexed with tribulation evil times began upon him when he was nothing but a boy he fell into a pit of trouble through his education and ever since from time to time new grief had overtaken him a merrier little chap or one more glad to make the best of things could not be found as was said to me by the cook and also the parlour-maid he would do things when he came out among the servants beautifully and the maids used to kiss him so that his breath was taken away with pleasing them and then he went to school and all the maids and boys and men almost came out to see the yellow coach and throw an old shoe after him this however did not help him as was seriously hoped and why because it went heel foremost from the stupidity of the caster news came in a little time that there was mischief upward and that master drake must be fetched home to give any kind of content again for he was at an ancient grammar school in a town seven miles from exeter where everything was done truly well to keep the boys from fighting 
only the habit and tradition was that if they must fight fight they should until one fell down and could not come to the scratch again and drake had a boy of equal spirit with his own to contend against not however of bone and muscle to support him thoroughly but who could grieve or feel it half so much as young drake bampfylde did when the other boy in three days time died from a buzzing upon his brain he might have got into mischief now even though he was a far higher family than the boy who had foundered instead of striking but chiefly for the goodwill of the school and by reason of the boy's father having plenty of children to feed and consenting to accept aid therein that little matter came to be settled among them very pleasantly only the course of young drake's life was changed thereby as follows the plan of his family had been to let him get plenty of learning at school and then go to oxford colleges and lay in more if agreeable and so grow into holy orders of the church of england well worth the while of any man who has a good connection but now it would seem without thinking twice that all the disturbers and blasphemers of the nonconformist tribe now arising everywhere as in dirty hezekiah and that greasy hepzibah who dared to dream such wickedness concerning even me every one of these rogues was sure to cast it up against a parson in his most heavenly stroke of preaching that he must hold his hand for fear of killing the clerk beneath him and so poor drake was sent to sea the place for all the scapegoats here ill fortune dogged him still as its manner always is after getting taste of us he heeded his business so closely that he tumbled into the sea itself and one of those brindle-bellied sharks took a mouthful out of him nevertheless he got over that and fell into worse trouble to wit in a very noble fight between his britannic majesty's sloop of war hell goblins carrying twelve guns and two carronades which came after my young time and the french corvette eloise of six-and-twenty heavy guns he put himself so forward that they trained every gun upon him of course those fellows can never shoot anything under the height of the moon because they never stop to think nevertheless he contrived to take considerable disadvantage by a random shot they carried off the whole of one side of his whiskers and the hearing of the other ear fell off though not involved in it the doctors could not make it out however i could thoroughly from long acquaintance with cannon-balls also he had marks of powder under his skin that would never come out being of a coarse-grained sort and something like the bits of tea that float in rich folks teacups happening as he did by nature to be a fine florid and handsome man this powder vexed him dreadfully nevertheless the ladies said loving powder of their own that it made him look so much nicer that however was quite a trifle when compared to his next misfortune being gazetted to a ship and the whole crew proud to sail under him he left the downs with the wind abaft and all hands in high spirits there was nothing those lads could not have done and in less than twelve hours they could do nothing a terrible gale from south-west arose in spite of utmost seamanship they were caught in the callipers of the varn and not a score left to tell of it these were things to try a man and prove the stuff inside him however he came out gallantly for being set afloat again after swimming all night and half a day he brought into the portland roads a crap o ship of twice his tonnage and three times his gunnage and now his sailors were delighted having hope of prize money that they never got of course which no doubt was all the better for their constitutions but their knowledge of battle led them to embark again with him having sense as we always have of luck and a crooked love of a man whose bad luck seems to have taken the turn and yet their judgment was quite amiss and any turn taken was all for the worse captain bampfylde did a thing which even i in my hotter days would rather have avoided he ran a thirty-two gun frigate under the chains of a sixty-four he thought that they must shoot over him while he laid his muzzles to her water-line and then carried her by boarding nothing could have been finer than this idea of doing it and with eight french ships out of nine almost he must have succeeded 
but once more his luck came over like a cloud and darkened him the frenchmen had not only courage which they have too much of but also what is not their gift with lucky people against them self-command and steadiness they closed their lower ports and waited for the englishmen to come up they knew that the side of their ship fell in like the thatch of a rick from the lower ports ten feet above the enemy they had their nettings ready and a lively sea was running it grieves as well as misbecomes me to describe the rest of it the englishmen swore with all their hearts at their ladders the sea and everything and their captain was cast down between the two ships and compelled to dive tremendously in a word it came to this that our people either were totally shot and drowned or spent the next sunday in prison at brest now here was a thing for a british captain such as the possibility of it never could be dreamed of to have lost one ship upon a french shoal and the other to a frenchman drake bampfylde but for inborn courage must have hanged himself outright and as it was he could not keep from unaccustomed melancholy and when he came home upon exchange it was no less than his duty to abandon pleasure now and cheerfulness and comfort only to consider how he might redeem his honour in the thick of this great trouble came another three times worse i know not how i could have borne it if it had been my case stoutly as i fight against the public's rash opinions for this captain was believed and with a deal of evidence to have committed slaughter upon his brother's children and even to have buried them he found it out of his power to prove that really he had not done it nor had even entertained a wish that it might happen so everybody thought how much their dying must avail him and though all had a good idea of his being upright most of them felt that this was nothing in such strong temptation i have spoken of this before and may be obliged again to speak of it only i have rebutted always and ever shall rebut low ideas yet if truly he did kill them was he to be blamed or praised for giving them good burial the testimony upon this point was no more than that of an unclad man which must of course have been worthless until they put him into a sack and in that form received it this fellow said that he was coming home towards his family very late one friday night and he knew that it was friday night because of the songs along the road of the folk from barnstaple market he kept himself out of their way because they had such a heap of clothes on and being established upon the sands for the purpose of washing his wife and children who never had seen water before and had therefore become visited he made a short cut across the sands to the hole they had all helped to scoop out in a stiff place where some roots grew this was his home and not a bad one for a seaside visit at any rate he seemed to have been as happy there as any man with a family can experience especially when all the members need continual friction this fine fellow was considering how he could get on at all with that necessary practice if the magistrates should order all his frame to be covered up and fearing much to lose all chance of any natural action because there was a crusade threatened he lay down in the moonlight and had a thoroughly fine roll in the sand before he had worn out this delight and while he stopped to enjoy it more he heard a sound not far away of somebody digging rapidly or at any rate if it was not digging it was something like it the weather was wonderfully hot so that the rushes scarcely felt even cool to his breast and legs in that utterly lonely place for now the road was a mile behind him and the sands without a track and the stars almost at midnight there came upon him sudden fright impossible to reason with he had nothing to be robbed of neither had he enemy as for soul he never yet had heard of any such ownership but an unknown latitude of terror overpowered him nothing leads a man like fear and this poor savage though so naked was a man of some sort therefore although he would far liefer have skulked off in the crannian shadows leaving the moon to see to it he could by no means find the power to withdraw himself like that the sound came through the rushes and between the moonlit hillocks so that he was bound to follow it crouching through the darker seams and setting down his toe-balls first as naked feet alone can do step by step he drew more near though longing to be further off and still he heard the heel struck spade and then a cast and then the sullen sound of sand a-sliding then he came to a hollow place and feared to turn the corner 
being by this time frightened more than any words can set before us back he stroked his shaggy hair and in a hat of rushes laid his poor wild face for gazing and in the depth of the hollow where the moonlight scarcely marked itself and there seemed a softer herbage than of dry junk rushes but the banks combed over so as to bury the whole three fathoms deep at their very first subsiding a man was digging a small deep grave on the slope of the bank and so as to do no mischief any longer two little bodies lay put back not flung anyhow but laid as if respect was shown to them each had a clean white nightgown on and lay in decorous attitude only side by side and ready to go into the grave together the man who was digging looked up at them and sighed at so much necessity and then fell to again and seemed desirous to have done with it so was the naked man who watched him fright by this time over creeping even his very eyeballs he blessed himself for his harmlessness and ill-will to discipline all the way home to his own sands hill and a hundredfold when he came to know after the dregs of fright had cleared that he had seen laid by for coolness by this awful grave-digger the cocked hat of a british captain in the royal navy this hat he had seen once before and wondered much at the use of it and obtained an explanation which he could not help remembering and fitting this to his own ideas he was as sure as sure could be that captain bampfylde was the man who was burying the children now when this story reached the ears of poor old sir philip whether before or after his visit to our country matters not it may be supposed what his feelings were of sorrow and indignation he sent for this savage who seemed beyond the rest of his tribe in intelligence as indeed was plainly shown by his coming to bathe his family and in spite of all the difference of rank and manner between them questions manifold he put but never shook his story and then he sent to exeter for a lawyer thoroughly famous for turning any man inside out and putting what he pleased inside him but even he was altogether puzzled by this man in the sack wherein he now lived for decorum's sake however raw it made him and the honest fellow said that clothing tempted him so to forsake the truth when he could not tell his own legs in it that it sapped all principle that question is not for me to deal with nor even a very much wiser man except that my glimpses of foreign tribes have all been in favour of nudity and the opposite practice is evidently against all the bent of our civilised women who are perpetually rebelling and more and more eager to open their hearts to their natural manifestation for the heart of a woman is not like a man's desperately wicked and how can they prove this unless they show its usual style of working only the other day i saw blank but back i must go to the heart of my tale in a word this fine male savage convinced every one he came into contact with which after his bathing was permitted if the other man bathed afterwards that truly surely and with no mistake he must have seen something what it was became naturally quite another question and upon this head no two people could be found of one opinion but though it proved an important point i will not dwell too long on it captain drake's boat to my firm belief never came once up the river now and i thought that my beautiful young lady seemed a little grieved at this every now and then she crossed on her way to see old women and even that old mother bang and the french maid became a plague to me she had laid herself out to obtain me because of the softness with which i carried her and her opposition to my quid naturally set her heart all the more upon me i will not be false enough to say that i did not think of her sometimes because she really did go on in a tantalizing manner and we seemed to have between us something when her lady's back was turned however she ought to have known that i never mean anything by this and if she chose to lie back like that and put her red lips toppermost the least thing she should have done was first to be up to our manners and customs End of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter thirty eight a fine old gentleman when i came to look round upon this state of things and consider it 
i made up my mind to tempt providence or rather perhaps the most opposite power by holding on where i was in spite of the parson and all his devices this was a stupid resolve and one on which he had fully calculated i was getting a little perhaps fond of nanette though not quite so much as she fancied feeling unable to pin my faith to a thing she had whispered into my ear to wit that she would thrice soon inherit one three grand money hundred thousand more than one great strong man could lift i asked her to let me come and try and she said it was possible to be having a thorough acquaintance with crapas and the small wretched particles of their money i did not attach much importance to this for i like our king's face and they have not got it and they seem to stamp their stuff anyhow but in spite of all prejudice it would be well to look a little into it particularly as this girl whether right or wrong in thousands had a figure not to be denied when you came home to her nevertheless i am not the man to part with myself at random and there was a good farmer's daughter now solid and two-and-thirty which is my favourite ship to sail in handy strong and with guns well up this young woman crossed the ferry at eightpence a day for my sake and i thought of retaining a lawyer to find what might be her prospects she was by no means bad to look at when you got accustomed and her nature very kind and likely to see to bunny's clothes also she never contradicted which is cotton wool to one who ever has rheumatics but i did not wish to pay six and eightpence and then be compelled to lose eightpence a day in order to steer clear of her so i ferried both her and nanette alike and let them encounter one another and charge no difference in their weight nothing better fits a man for dealing with the womankind than to be well up in fish now i found the benefit of that knowledge where i never looked for it and i knew the stale from the fresh though these come alike in the pickle of matrimony also which is far more to the point the soft rose from the hard rose these you cannot change but must persuade yourself to like whichever you happen to get of them and that you find out afterwards while i was dwelling upon these trifles and getting on well with my serious trade working my ferry and catching salmon so as to amaze the neighbourhood also receiving my well-earned salary from the fair mistress isabel and surprising the public-houses every night with my narratives in a word becoming the polar star of both sides of the river a thing befell me which was quite beyond all sense of reason through wholesome fear of parson chowne and knowledge of his fire tricks i kept the rose of devon in a berth of deep fresh water where a bulk of sand backed up and left a large calm pool of river here the dimpling water scarcely had the life to flow along when the tide was well away and scarcely brought a single bubble big enough to break upon us according to the weather so the colour of the water was only when you understood it seemed to please you always one night i was not asleep but getting very near it setting in my mind afloat as i felt the young tide flowing thoughts or dreams or lighter visions than the lightest dream that flits of about concerning touching anyhow regarding or in any lightest side light gleaming who can tell or glancing from the checkers of the day work suddenly a great explosion blew me out of my berth and filled the whole of the cuddy with blaze and smoke i lay on the floor half stunned and with only sense enough for wondering then providence enabled me on the strength of the battles i had been through to get on my elbow and look around everything seemed quite odd and stupid for a little while to me i neither knew where i was nor what had happened or would happen me it may have been half an hour or it may have been only half a minute before i was all alive again and able to see to the mischief 
then i found that a very rude thing had been done and a most unclerical action not to be lightly excused and wholly undeserved on my part a good-sized kettle of gunpowder had been cast into my cuddy possibly as a warning to me but to say the least a dangerous one my wrath overcame all fear so much that in spite of the risk of meeting others i rushed through the smoke and up the ladder and seized my gun from its sling on the deck and gazed or rather i should say stared in every direction around me but whether from the darkness of the night or the stinging and stunning turmoil in my eyes and upon my brain i could not descry any moving shape or any living creature and this even added to my alarm so that i got very little more sleep that night i do assure you however i kept my own counsel about it even from my lady patroness resolving to maintain a sharp lookout and act as behooved a gallant simro thrown amongst a host of savages to this intent i took our tiller which was just about six feet long and entirely useless now and i put a bit of a bottom to it so as to stand quite decently and fixed a cross trestle for shoulders and then dressed it up so with my old fishing suit and a castaway hat to encourage my brains that really though the thing was so grave i could not help laughing at myself in the dusk it was so like me when the labours of the day were over and the gleam of the water deadened i set up this other fine davy llewellyn on board the ketch now here now there sometimes leaning over the bulwarks in contemplation of the river which was my favourite attitude from my natural turn for reflection sometimes idly at work with a rope or anything or nothing only so as to be seen from shore and exposed to the public his whereabouts meanwhile i crouched in a ditch hard by and with both barrels loaded you will say this was an unchristian thing especially as i suspected strongly that my besiegers wore naked backs and would therefore receive my discharge in full i will not argue that point but tell you in common fairness to myself and to prevent any slur of the warm affection long subsisting between all who have cared to listen to me and my free self that whenever i hoped for a chance at those fellows i drew the duck shot from the first barrel and put a light charge of snipe shot in which no man could object to the second barrel was ready in case that the worst should come to the worst as we say now it is a proof of my bad luck and perhaps of my having done a thing below the high welsh nature that providence never vouchsafed me a single shot at any one of them the more trouble i took the less they came until i could scarcely crook my fingers through the rheumatics they brought on me night after night i said to myself if it only pleases the lord to save me from the wiles of this anointed one i vow to go back to my duty and teach those other young chits of boys their work for i had observed though i would not tell it except in a rheumatic twinge that even captain bampfylde's men had lost the style of drawing oars through the water properly and as i used to give the tune five and twenty years agone it is needless to say that after all the close actions i have conquered in a canister of gunpowder was nothing to disturb me but as they might do worse next time whether in joke or earnest i made me a hutch of stout strong oak also cut the bulkhead out and freed myself into the hold at once upon any unjust disturbance nigh me was my double gun heavily shotted at bedtime and the spar which had knocked down parson chowne and might have to do it again perhaps and now i began to persuade myself into happy sleep again for my nature is not vindictive one night i lay broad awake perhaps from having shot a curlew and eaten him without an onion sewn inside while roasting but he had been so hard to shoot that i was full of zeal to dine upon him and had no onion handy whether it were so or not i lay awake and thought about the strange things now come over me to be earning money at a very noble rate indeed to be winning the attentions of it may be ten young women each of whom believe that never had i been in love before and to be establishing a business which could scarcely fail of growing to a public-house with benches and glass windows looking down upon the river 
and yet with all this prospect brewing scarcely to have a moment's peace what a lucky thing for parson chowne that i have no cold black blood in me in this medley of vague thoughts such as all men of large brain have and even myself when the moon ordains it a strong and good idea struck me and one to be dwelled upon to-morrow and if then approved to be carried out immediately this was no less than to beg an audience of sir philip bampfylde himself and tell him all that i ever had seen of chowne and his devices and place sir philip on his guard and learn maybe a little of the many things that puzzled me of course i had thought of this before but for several reasons had forborne to carry it any further in the first place it seemed such a coarse rude way of meeting plans that should be met with equal stealth and subtlety unless a man were prepared to own himself vanquished in intelligence again it would have been very difficult to obtain a private interview without some stir concerning it moreover i felt a delicacy with respect to my stewardship on behalf of those two children for a stranger might not at a glance perceive that prudence and self-denial on my part which the worrisome frivolousness of the fish had for the time frustrated however i now perceived that a gentleman of sir philip's lofty bearing could not with any grace or dignity allude to his own beneficence and as for the second difficulty i might hope for miss carey's good offices while i could no longer think to encounter chowne with his own weapons since he had blown me out of bed accordingly i persuaded my beautiful young lady who had plenty of sense but not much craft and was pleased with my straightforwardness to lead me into sir philip's presence in a lonely part of the grounds near the river to the westward and out of sight of the house in a word not far from the braunton burrows here the river made a bend and came to the breast of an ancient orchard rich with grass and thick with trees leafless now but thickly bearded upon every twig with moss this was of every form and fashion and of almost every hue i had never seen such a freaksome piece of work outside the tropics although in devonshire common enough where the soil is moist and the climate damp some of these trees lay down on the ground as if they were tired of standing and some were in sitting postures and some half leaning over but all alive in spite of that and fruitful when it suited them and everything being neglected now from want of the squire's attention heaps of rosy and golden apples lay where they had been piled to sweat but never led to the cider-press perceiving no sign of sir philip about and remembering how it was now beginning to draw on for christmas-time i felt myself welcome to one or two of these neglected apples for it was much if nobody of the farmer's wives who crossed the ferry could afford me a goose for christmas in my solitary hole and even if all should fail disgracefully of their duty towards me i had my eye on a nice young bird of more than the average plumpness who neglected his parents advice every day and came for some favourite grass of his which only grew just on the river's verge within thirty yards of my fussel it would have shown low curiosity to ask if he owned an owner from his independent manner i felt that he must be public property and i meant to reduce him into possession right early in the morning of the saint that was so incredulous it is every man's duty to treat himself well at the time of the holy nativity and having a knowledge of devonshire geese after two months on the stubbles i could not do better than store in my boat one or two of these derelict apples never do i see or taste an apple without thinking of poor bardie appledees she always called them and she was so fond of them and her little white teeth made marks like a small tooth comb in the flesh of them i was thinking of her and had scarcely embarked more than a bushel or so for sauce in a little snug locker of my own when i had the pleasure of seeing the gentleman whom i had come all that way to see at my own desire and through miss carey's faith in me it had not been laid before sir philip that i was likely to meet him here only she had told me when and where to come across him so as not to be broken in upon now he came down the narrow winding walk 
at the lower side of the orchard a path overhanging a little brook which murmured under last summer's growth and i gazed at him silently for a while through the bushes that overhung my boat he was dressed as when i had seen him last through my telescope at the time we came up the river that is to say in black velvet and with his long sword hanging beside him a brave and stately and noble man walking through a steady gloom of grief and yet content to walk alone and never speak of it i leaped through the bush at the river's brink and suddenly stood before him he set his calm cold gaze upon me without a shadow of surprise as if to say you have no business in my private grounds however it is not worth speaking of i made him a low bow with my hat off and he moved his own and was passing on will your worship look at me i said and see whether you remember me he seemed just a little surprised and then with his inborn courtesy complied i have seen you before but i know not where sir i often need pardon now for the weakness of my memory in a few words i brought to his mind that evening visit to my cottage with anthony stew and the yellow carriage to be sure to be sure i remember now he said with his grave and placid smile david llewellyn both good old names and the latter i dare say in your belief both the older and the better one i remember your hospitality your patience and your love of children is there anything i can do for you no your worship nothing i am here for your sake only although if i wanted i would ask you having found you so good and kind whence did you get that expression my friend the common usage is kind and good i once knew a very little child but i suppose it is the welsh idiom your worship i can speak english thoroughly better even than my own language and all around us the scholarly people have more english than of welsh but to let your worship know my cause to come so much upon you is of things more to the purpose i have found a bad man meaning mischief to your worship it cannot be so he replied withdrawing as if i were taking a liberty no doubt but you mean me well llewellyn and yourself believe it but neither i nor any one else of all my family now so small can have given reason for any ill-will towards us it was not for me to dare to speak while the general was reflecting thus as if in his own mind going through every small accident of his life even the servants he might have discharged or the land forces ordered for punishment whereof to my mind they lack more than they get and grow their backs up in a manner beyond all perception of discipline for my part i could not help thinking as i watched him carefully how low and black must be the nature of the heart that could rejoice in such a man's unhappiness a man who at three score years and five was compelled to rack his memory even after being long in uncontrolled authority to find a time when he might have given cause for a private enmity if i had only enjoyed such chances i must have had at least a score of strong enemies by this time being a little surprised i looked again and again at his white eyebrows while his eyes were on the ground also at his lips and nostrils which were highly dignified and i saw in my dry low way one reason why he had never given offence he was perhaps a little scant of humour and of quickness which two things give more offence to the outer world that has them not than the longest course of rigid business carried on without them i have seen a man who could not crack nuts fly into a fury with one who could and these reflections made me even yet more anxious to serve him so grave and calm and simple-minded and so patient was his face nevertheless i did not desire i would at that point of his sword have refused a halfpenny for the things of import which i now disclosed to him he led me to an ancient bench beneath a well-worn apple-tree and sat thereon and even signed for me to sit beside him my knowledge of his rank would not permit me to do this until i was compelled to argue 
a gentleman more shaped and set inside his own opinions it had never been my luck to have to deal with now and then there are men you cannot laugh at though you get the best of them unless your conscience works with such integrity as theirs does and the sense of this in some way unknown may have now been over me how i began it or even showed my sense of manners and of all the different rank between us is beyond my knowledge now and must have flowed from instinct then enough that i did lead sir philip to have thoughts and to hearken me with a power not expected by myself at first beginning while in doubt of throat and words i contrived to set before him much that had befallen me though i never said a word that lay outside my knowledge neither let a spark of heat find entrance to my mind at all and would rather speak too little than be thought outrageous there could be no doubt that my simple way of putting all i had to say moved this lofty man as if he were one of the children at the well belonging to john the baptist i thought of all those pretty dears as i beheld him listening and the way they sat around me and their style of moving toes at any great catastrophe whiles they kept their hands and noses under very stiff control also the universal sigh when my story killed any one by any means unfit to die and their pure contempt of the things they suck the whole while they are swallowing sir philip to whom my thoughts meant no failure of respect but feeling of simplicity this old gentleman let me speak as one well accustomed to lengthiness but i did my best to keep a small helm and yards on the creek for bracing if i take you aright he said as i drew near the end of my story you have not a high opinion of that reverend gentleman stoyle chowne i look upon him your worship as the blackest-hearted son of belial ever sent into this world sir philip frowned as behooved a man accustomed to authority and only to have little words half spoken out before him but at my time of life no officer under an admiral on full pay could have any right to damp my power of expression however my respect was such for the presence of this nobleman that i rose and made a leg to him i am sorry to say he answered bowing to my bow as all gentlemen must do that this is not the first time i have heard unpleasant things about poor stoyle he is my godson and has been almost as one of my own children i never can believe that he would ever do me injury if i thought it i should have to think amiss of almost every one he turned away as if already he had said more than he meaned and feeling how he treated me as if of his own rank almost i did not wonder at the tales of men who give their lives to save him in the bloody battle time knowing the world as i do i only sighed and waited for him you are very good he said without a tone of patronage to have thought to help me by delivering your opinions a heavy trouble has fallen upon us and the goodwill of the neighbourhood has many times astonished me however you must indulge no more in any such wild ideas they all proceed from the evil one and are his choicest device to lower the value of holy orders the rev stoyle chowne descends from a very good old family at any rate on his father's side and he has his dignity to maintain and his holy office to support him on this head i will hear no more the general shut his mouth and closed it so that i could never dare to open mine again to him concerning this one subject and his manner stopped me so that i only made my duty this he acknowledged in a manner which became both him and me and then he passed through a little gate to his usual walk upon braunton burrows End of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore 
chapter thirty nine notice to quit we were now come to the time of year which all good christians celebrate by goodwill and festivities even i in my humble way had made some preparation for this holy period by shooting farmer badcock's goose which had long been in my mind upon plucking he turned out even whiter and better than expectation and the tender down clung to him in a way that showed his texture i hung him up in a fine through draught and rejoiced in the thought of him every time my head came in between his legs neither did he fall away when he came to roasting but when i had put him down upon the christmas morning with intent to stick thereby and baste him up to one o'clock dipping bits of bread beneath him as he might begin to drip and winning thus for taste of him all my plans were overset by a merry party coming and demanding fairy with my lovely goose beginning just to spread his skin a little and hiss sweetly at the fire up i ran with resolution not to fairy anybody but to cook my goose aright nevertheless it might not be so here were three young fellows ramping of the high nobility swearing to come aboard and stick me if i would not ferry them it was not that i feared of this but that i beheld a guinea spinning in the morning sun which compelled me to forego and leave my poor young goose to roll around and try to roast himself therefore i backed him from the fire and laid half a pound of slow lard on his breast and trusted his honour to keep alive these young joyous fellows were now awake to everything they had begun the morning bravely with a cup of rum and lemon then a tender grill of beef and a quart of creamy ale every one accordingly and they meant to keep the day up to no less a pattern being all of fine old birth and bound to act accordingly however it had been said by some one that they ought to go to church and they happened to feel the strength of this and vowed that the devil should catch the hindmost unless they struck out for it hence i came to win the pleasure of their company that day their nearest church was the little simple quiet old church at ashford from my ferry i could see it and it often made me sigh because it looked so tranquil sweet green land sloped up towards it with a trace of crooked footpaths and the nicks of elbowed hedges where the cows came down and stood also from it looking downward through the valley of the taw may be seen a spread of beauty and of soft variety and of largeness opening larger with the many winding waters to the ocean unbeheld that the sternest man must sigh and look again and look again a genuine parson now was master of this queer old quiet church a man who gave his life entire for the good of other men in a little hut he lived which the clerk's house overrode just at the turning of the lane upon the steep ascent and where the thunder showers flooded it all the poor folk soon began to dwell upon his noble nature and to feel that here was some one fit to talk of saviours miles around they came to hear him so that he was forced to stand on a stool in the porch and speak to them for speaking it was and not preaching which made all the difference these three gay young sparks leaped lightly into the bow of my ferry-boat and bade me pull for my very life unless i desired to be flung into the water then and there a strong spring tide was running up and i was forced to pull the starboard oar with all my might to keep the course my passengers were carrying on with every sort of quip and crank and jokes that made the boat to tilt when suddenly a rush of water flooded their silk stockings i thought at first that the bung was out and told them not to be frightened but in another breath i saw that it was a great deal worse than that the water was rushing in through a mighty hole in the planks of the larboard bow and in three minutes we must be swamped 
all aft all aft in a moment i cried it is our only chance of reaching shore the gallants were sobered at once by fright and i bundled them into the stern sheets sat on the aftmost thwart myself and for the lives of us all pulled back towards the bank we had lately quitted by casting all the weight thus astern i raised the leak up to the water-line except when we plunged to the lift of the oars and the water poured in less rapidly now with the set of the tide on our starboard beam however with all this and all my speed and my passengers showing great presence of mind we barely managed to touch the bank and jump out when down she foundered at first i was at a loss altogether even to guess how this thing had happened for the boat seemed perfectly sound and dry at the time of our leaving the shore but as soon as the tide was out and i could get at her i perceived that a trick of entirely fiendish cunning and atrocity had been played upon me a piece of planking a foot in length and from eight to ten inches wide had been cut out with a keyhole saw at the time she was lying high and dry and doubtless before daybreak this had been then replaced most carefully with a little caulking so that it was water-tight without strong pressure from outside but the villain had contrived it knowing in what state of tide i was likely next to work the ferry so that the rush of water could not fail to beat the piece in it made my blood run cold to think of the stealthiness of this attempt as well as the skill it was compassed with for the chances were ten to one almost in favour of its drowning me and leaving a bad name behind me too for having drowned my passengers and to this it must have come if so much as a single woman had been in the boat that day for these when in danger always do the very worst thing possible and the manager of this clever scheme knew of course that my freight was likely on the christmas morning to be chiefly female luckily i had refused two boatloads of young and attractive womankind not from religious feeling only but because i had to chop a trencher full of stuffing this affair impressed me so with a sense of awe and reverence and a certainty that parson chowne must be in direct receipt of counsel from the evil one that my mind was good to be off at once and thank the lord for escaping him for let us see what must have happened but for the goodness and fatherly care of a merciful providence over me the boat would have sunk in the very midst of the rapid and icy river david llewellyn with his accustomed fortitude would have endeavoured to swim ashore and yet could not have resisted the claims of three or even four young women who doubtless would have laid hold of him all screaming splashing and dragging him down the mind refuses to contemplate such a picture any longer this matter could not be kept quiet as the first attempt had been but spread from house to house and gained in size from each successive tongue until the man at the foot of the bridge who naturally detested me whispered into every ear that it was high time to have a care of that interloping welshman who had drowned six fine young noblemen for the sake of their buckles and watches and my courage was at so low an ebb that when he retreated into his house i could not even bring my mind to the power of kicking his door in hence that calumny not being quenched went the round of the neighbourhood and i might as well haul down my sign and the hopes of any public-house became a fading vision and of all the fine young women who had set their hearts upon keeping it as i described my intention to them and who had picked up bits of welsh for an access to my heart in all its patriotism there was not one worth looking at or fit to be a landlady who took the trouble to come near me in the frosty weather when a man is forsaken by the world he must have recourse to reason and if only borne up thereby and with a little cash in hand he can wait till the world comes round again this was my position now i never had behaved so well in all my life before i think though always conscientious but of late i had felt as it were in one perpetual round of bitter wrestling with the evil one 
men of a loose kind may not see that this was tenfold hard upon me from my props being knocked away i mean my entire trust and leaning upon the ancient church of england which perhaps by repulsion from those fellows that came after our old ham as well as our proper parson's knowledge of souls and the way to fry them had increased upon me so that my heart leaped up whenever i heard the swing of a bell on sunday some of this perhaps was owing to my thoughts of newton clock and twelve shillings now due to me from my captainship thereof but how could this loyal and ecclesiastical fervour thrive while a man in holy orders did such unholy things to me the only one with faith enough and sense enough to stand by me now through this bitter trial was that beautiful young lady whom i did admire so and if till now i admired only now i did adore her nanette did for herself with me and all her hopes of ever being mrs david llewellyn by poking up her little toes and i saw that they were all square almost and with guttural noises crying that on board my boat she would not dare miss carey laughed at her and stepped with her beautiful boots on board of me and from that moment she might do exactly as she pleased with me however my fairy was knocked on the head and all the hopes of a wife and family and even a public-house in skittles which i had been long building up as well as to train our bunny for barmaid which must always be done quite young to get the proper style of it and thorough acquaintance with measures how to make them look quite brim up when they are only three parts full all golden dreams will vanish thus no life of smiling boniface but of gun muzzles was before me no casting up of shot by pence but ramming down on pounds of powder let that pass my only wish is to conceal in the strictest manner little trifles about myself isabel carey was so shocked at hearing of our danger as by me distinctly told without a word of flourish that she made me promise strongly to give up my ferrying this i was becoming ready more and more every day to do especially as nobody ever now came down for porterage but i told the lady how hard it was to have formed such a valuable trade or you might say an institution and then to lose it all because of certain private enmities what she said or did hereon is strictly a family question and can in no way concern the public since i hauled my flag down and now i gained more insight into my great enemy's schemes and doings than i could have acquired while engaged so much at ferry for time allowed me to maintain that strict watch upon narnton court which was now become my duty as well as an especial pleasure for the following reason i began to see most clearly that the foul outrage upon my boat must have been perpetrated by one or both of those savage fellows who were employed as spies upon this great house from the landward side they must have forded the river which is not more than three feet deep in places when the tide is out and no floods coming down these two cunning barbarians came of course from the nympton rookery but were lodging for the present in a hole they had scooped for themselves in the loneliest part of Bronton burrows of course they durst not go about in a peopled and civilized neighborhood with such an absence of apparel as they could indulge at home still they were unsightly objects and decent people gave them a wide berth when possible but my firm intention was to grapple with these savage scoundrels and to prove at their expense what a civilized welshman is and how capable of asserting his commercial privileges only as they carried knives i durst not meet them both at once and even should i catch them singly some care was advisable so as take them off their guard because i would not lower myself to the use of anything more barbarous than an honest cudgel however although i watched and waited and caught sight of them more than once especially at night-time when they roved most freely it was long before i found it prudent to bear down on the enemy not from any fear of them but for fear of slaying them as i might be forced to do if they rushed with steel at me one night after the turn of the days and with mild weather now prevailing and a sense of spring already fluttering in the valleys i sat in a dark embrasure at the end of narnton court there had been more light than usual in the windows of the great dining-room which now was very seldom used for hospitable purposes 
and now two gentlemen came forth as if for a little air to take a turn on the river terrace it did not cost me long to learn that one was good sir philip bamfylde and the other that very wicked chowne the latter had manifestly been telling some of his choicest stories and held the upper hand as usual general take my arm the flags are rough and the night is of the darkest you must gravel this terrace for the sake of your guests after your port wine dick said the general with a sigh for he was a most hospitable man and accustomed to the army dick thou hast hardly touched my port and i like not to have it slighted sir what excuse the parson made i did not hear but knew already that one of his countless villainies was his rude contempt of the gift of god as vouchsafed to noah and confirmed by the very first rainbow which continues the colours thereof up to this time of writing sir philip leaned on the parapet some twenty yards to windward of me and he sniffed the fine fresh smell of seaweed and sea-water coming up the river with a movement of four knots an hour and in his heart he thanked the lord very likely without knowing it then he seemed to sigh a little and to turn to chowne and say dick this is not as it should be look at all this place and up and down all this length of river every light you can see burning is in a house that longs to me and who is now to have it all it used to make me proud but now it makes me very humble you are a parson tell me dick what have i done to deserve it all the rev richard stoyle chowne had not whatever his other vices were one grain of pious hypocrisy in all his foul composition if he had he might have flourished and with his native power must have been one of the foremost men of this or any other age but his but his pride allowed him never to let in pretence religion into the texture of his ways a worse man need not be desired and yet he did abhor all cant to such a degree that he made a mock of his own church services general i have naught to say you have asked this question more than once you know what my opinion is i know that you have the confidence sir every honourable man must have in my poor son's innocence you support it against every one against all the world against even you when you allow yourself to doubt it tush i would not think twice of it however many candles burn this was a touch of his nasty sarcasm which he never could deny himself up and down the valley general no son of yours however wild and troubled in expenditure could ever shape or even dream of anything dishonourable i hope not i hope to god not sir philip said with a little gasp as if he were fearing otherwise dick you are my godson and you have been the greatest comfort to me because you never would believe not another word general you must not dwell on this matter so the children were fine little dears of course very clever and very precious oh if you only knew the words dick my little granddaughter would come out with scarcely anything you could think of would have been too big for her little mouth and if she could not do it once she never let it till she did where it came from i could not tell for we are not great at languages but it must have been of her mother's race and the boy though not with gifts of that sort oh you ought to have seen his legs dick at least till he took the whooping cough the stately old gentleman leaned and dropped a tear perhaps into the river tall general i understand it all said chowne though he never had a child by reason of the almighty's mercy to the next generation of course these pretty children were a great delight to every one but affairs of this sort happen in all ancient families the mere extent of land appears to open for clandestine graves that wicked devilish story dick did you tell me or did you not to take it as the fiend's own lie a lie of course as concerns the captain from their want of knowledge but concerning some one else true enough i fear i fear both men had by this time very nearly said their say throughout the general seemed to be overcome and the parson to be growing weary of a subject often treated in discourse between them before you go in the morning dick said the old man now recovering i wish to consult you about a matter nearly concerning young isabel she is a distant cousin of yours you thoroughly understand the law of which i have very little knowledge perhaps you will meet me in the book-room for half an hour's quiet talk before we go to breakfast i cannot do it sir philip i have my own affairs to see to i must be off when the moon is up i cannot sleep in your house this night End of chapter thirty nine chapter forty 
of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter forty forcible ejectment those things which have been settled for us by long generations of ancestors all of whom must have considered the subjects one after the other painfully and brought good minds of ancient strength less led away than ours are to bear upon what lay before them also living in a time when money went much further and got a deal more change in honesty which was then more plentiful to rush i say against the bulwarks of our noble elders who showed the warmth of their faith by roasting all who disagreed with them would be ay and ever will be a proof of a rebellious scurvy and perpetually scabby nature the above fine reflection came home to me just as my pipe grew sweet and rich after an excellent dinner provided by that most thoughtful and bright young lady the hon isabel carey upon a noble new year's day in the year of our lord one thousand seven hundred and eighty three her ladyship now had begun to feel that interest in my intelligence and unusual power of narrative as well as that confidence in my honour and extreme veracity which without the smallest effort or pretence on my part seemed to spring by some law of nature in every candid mind i meet combining this lady's testimonials as presented weekly with some honourable trifles picked up here and there along shore in spite of all discouragement perhaps i congratulated myself on having turned the corner of another year not badly i counted my money to the tune of five-and-twenty level pounds an amount of cash beyond all experience yet instead of being dazzled i began to see no reason for not having fifty not that i ever thought of money but for the sake of the children the tears came into my eyes to think of these poor little creatures bardie with all her fount of life sanded up as one might say in that old scar warren and bunny with her strength of feeding weakened over rice and fowl food such as old charles morgan kept who had been known to threaten to feed his family upon sawdust a most respectable man as well as churchwarden and undertaker but being bred a pure carpenter he thought when his money came in fast and great success surprised him that providence would be offended at his waste of sawdust now this was the man who had bunny to keep entirely from his own wish of course or the sense of the village concerning her and many times i had been ready to laugh and as many times to cry almost whenever i thought of the many things that were likely to happen between them to laugh when i thought of churchwarden's face regarding our bunny at breakfast time and the way she would say i want some more through his narrow-shouldered children to cry when i thought of my dear son's child and as dear to me as my own almost getting less of victuals daily as her welcome should grow staler and giving way to her old trick of standing on the floor with eyes shut and with shut mouth to declare i won't eat now you have starved me so and no one in that house with wit to understand and humour her and then i could see her go to bed in a violent temper anyhow and when the wind boxed round to north i could hear her calling granny this very tender state of mind and sense of domestic memories seems to have drawn me so far as i can in a difficult case remember it towards a very ancient inn having two bow windows when i entered no man could be in a stricter state of sobriety and as if it were yesterday i remember asking the price of everything the people were even inclined to refuse to draw anything in the small liquor line for a man with so little respect for trade as to walk so straight upon new year's day after a little while i made them see that this was not so much my fault as my misfortune 
and when i declared my name of course and my character came forward even rum shrub out of a cask with golden hoops around it scarcely seemed to be considered good enough for me gratis but throughout the whole of this i felt an anxious and burning sense of eager responsibility coupled with a strong desire to be everywhere at once right early to the very utmost of my recollection i tumbled into my lonely berth after seeing my fussel primed and praying to the lord for guidance through another and a better year i had clean sheets which are my most luxurious gift of feeling and having no room to stretch my legs or roll i managed space to yawn and then went off deliciously now i was beginning to dream about the hole i had placed my money in a clever contrivance of my own and not in the cuddy at all because the enemy might attack me there when a terrible fit of coughing came and saved my life by waking me the little cuddy was full of smoke parching blinding choking smoke so thick that i could scarcely see the red glare of fire behind it through the battress of the bulkhead good lord i cried have mercy on me sure enough i am done for now and nobody ever will know or care what the end was of old dio i did not stop still to say all this that you may be quite sure of and it argues no small power of speech that i was able to say anything for with a last desire for life and despairing resolve to try again i broke my knuckles against the hatch which i had made so heavy for the purpose of protecting me to go out through my door would have been to rush into the fire itself and what with the choking and the thickness and the terror of the flames violently reddening and roaring a few feet away i felt my wits beginning to fail me which of course was certain death so i sat down on a three-legged stool which was all my furniture and for a moment the rushing smoke drew by some draught otherwhere and whether i would or no a deal of my past life came up to me i wondered whether i might have been too hard sometimes on any one or whether i might have forgotten to think of the lord upon any sunday and then my thoughts were elevated to the two dear children now what do you think happened to me when i thought of those two darlings and the tears from smoke made way for the deep-born tears of a noble heart why simply that a flash of flame glanced upon the iron crowbar wherewith i had opened hatch i could not have been in pure bright possession of my maker's gifts to me when i chanced before going to bed to lay that crowbar for my pillow-case nevertheless i had done it well and in the stern perception of this desperate extremity i could not help smiling at the way i had tucked up my head on the crowbar but though no time is lost in smiling i had not a moment to lose even now although with my utmost wits all awake and coughing i prized the hatch up in half a moment where it was stuck in the combings and if ever man enjoyed a draught i did so of air that moment many men might have been frightened still and not have known what to do with themselves but i assure you in all honour that the whole of my mind came back quite calmly when i was out of smothering people may say what they like but i know after seeing every form of death and you need not laugh at me very much if i even said feeling it i know no anguish to be compared to the sense of being pressed under slowly and the soul with no room to get away but i was under the good stars now and able to think and to look about and though the catch could not last long being of ninety-two tons only i found time enough to kneel and thank my god for his mercy to me there was no ice in the river now and to swim ashore would have been but little except for rheumatics afterwards but it seemed just as well to escape even these and having been burned out at sea before i was better enabled to manage it the whole of the waist of the catch was in flames curling and beginning now to indulge their desire of roaring but the kindness of the lord prevented wind from blowing had there been only a four-knot breeze you would never have heard of me again surely which would grieve you in this very sad state of mind combined with a longing for thankfulness and while i was thinking about the fire to say the truth very stupidly and wondering instead of working quite an old-fashioned affair restored me to my wits and my love of the world again this was the strong sour sound of the air when a bullet comes through it hastily and casting reproach upon what we breathe for its want of a stronger activity 
a man had made a shot at me i must have been a lubber by his want of range and common sense before i could think i was all alive and fit to enjoy myself almost as if it were a fight with frenchmen the first thing i thought of was the gun lent to me by miss carey to rescue this i went down even into the cuddy which had so lately proved my very grave almost and after this i saw no reason why i should not save my money if the lord so willed it from a sense of all the mischief even now around me i had made a clever hole in the bow knees of the catch where the wood lay thickest and so had plugged my money up with the power to count it daily and now in spite of flame and roar and heat of all the midships and the spluttering of the rock-powder bags too wet to be unanimous i made my mind up just to try to save my bit of money because although a man may be as coarse and wicked and vile-hearted as even my very worst enemies are he cannot fail of getting on and being praised and made the best of if he only does his best to stick tight to his money therefore having no boat within reach and the midship all aflame i made a raft of the cuddy hatch and warped along by the side of the catch and purchased my cash from its little nest and then with a thankful heart and nothing but a pair of breeches on made the best of my way ashore punting myself with a broken oar this desire to sacrifice me without the trouble even taken to count what my value was gave me such a sense of shock and of spreading abroad everywhere without any knowledge left of what might have become of me and the subject liable to be dropped if ever entered into by a jolly crowner and a jury glad to please him that for the moment i sat down upon a shelf of clay until the wet came through my want of clothes suddenly this roused me up to make another trial for the sake of my well accustomed and familiar suit of clothes so well beloved also even my sunday style more striking but less comfortable in lack of which the world could never have gone on in our neighbourhood therefore i ran to my little punt and pushed off and was just in time to save my kit with a little singeing the catch burned down to the water's edge and then a rough tide came up and sank her leaving me in a bitter plight and for some time quite uncertain how to face the future from knowledge of the parson's style of treating similar cases i felt it to be a most likely thing that i should be charged with firing her robbing her and concealing booty and this injustice added to the bitterness of my close escape it is no use i said aloud it is useless to contend with him he has sold himself to satan and thank god i have no chance with him therefore by the time the fire had created some disturbance in the cottage bedrooms i had got my clothing on in a decent though hasty manner and slipped into a little wood with my spy-glass happily saved and resolved to watch what happened in amongst the bumpkins these came down and stared and gawked and picked up bits of singed spars and so on and laid down the law to one another and fought for the relics and thought it hard that no man's body was to be found with clothes on i saw them hunting for me up and down the river channel with a desperate ignorance of tide although living so close to it and i did not like to have my body hunted for like that but i repressed all finer feelings as a superior man must do and chewed the tip of a bullock's tongue which luckily was in my waistcoat pocket ready for great emergency and which if a man keeps going on with he may go like the great elijah forty days and feel no hunger at least i have heard so and can believe it having seen men who told me so but i would rather have it proved by another man's experience while i was looking on at these things down came parson chowne himself in a happy mood and riding the black mare now brought out of dock again the country folk all fell away from their hope of stealing something and laid fingers to their hats being afraid to talk of him he however did no more than sign to the serving man behind him to acknowledge compliments which was outside his own custom and then he put spurs to his horse and galloped right and left through the lot of them in my anxiety to learn what this dreadful man was up to i slipped down through the stubs of the wood where the faggot cutters had been at work gliding even upon my jersey because of the parson's piercing eyes and there in the ditch i found some shelter and spied through a bushy breastwork no more than i expected he cried from what i have seen of the fellow he has fired the ship and run away with all he could lay hands on as a justice of the peace i offer ten pounds reward for david llewellyn brought before me alive or dead is there one of you rantipoles can row 
oh you can take this shilling and be off with that big thief's ferry boat and leave it at sam tucker's shipyard in the name of the reverend stoyle chowne it went to my heart that none of the people to whom i had been so good and kind to use pretty bardie's phrase now had the courage to stand up and say that my character was most noble and claim back my boat for me instead of that they all behaved as if i had never ferried them and the ingratitude of the young women made me long to be in wales again because you may say what you like but the first point in our people is gratitude of course cried chowne and his voice though gently used came down the wind like a bell of course good people you have not found the corpse of that wretched villain us would give un up glad enough if us only get the lock for ten zilling your reverence lay valoon tan pond when that miserable miser said a thing so low as that my very flesh crept on my bones and my inmost heart was sick with being made so very little of to myself i always had a proper sense of estimation and to be put at this low figure made me doubt of everything however i came to feel after a bit that this is one of the trials which all good men must put up with neither would a common man find his corpse worth ten pounds sterling betwixt my sense of public value a definite sum at any rate and imagination of what my truly natural abilities might lead me to if properly neglected i found it a blessed hard thing to lie quiet until dark and then slip out and the more so because my stock of food was all consumed by middle day and before the sun went down hunger of a great shape and size arose and raged within me this is always difficult to discipline or to reason with and to men of the common order it suggests great violence to me it did nothing of that kind but led me into a little shop where i paid my money and got my loaf my flint and steel and tinder-box lay in my pocket handy these i felt and felt again and went into the woods and thought and found that even want of food had failed to give me a thorough-going and consistent appetite because for the first time in my life i had shaped a strong resolve and sworn to the lord concerning it to commit a downright crime and one which i might be hanged for although every one who has entered into my sufferings and my dignity must perceive how right i was and would never inform against me i will only say that on saturday evening parson chowne had fourteen ricks and on sunday morning he had none and might begin to understand the feelings of the many farmers who had been treated thus by him right gladly would i have beheld his face so rigid and contemptuous at other people's trouble when he should come to contemplate his own works thus brought home to him but i could not find a hedge thick enough to screen me from his terrible piercing eyes this little bit of righteous action made a stir you may be sure because it was so contrary to the custom of the neighbourhood although i went to see this fire i took the finest care to leave no evidence behind me and even turned my bits of toggery inside out at starting but there was a general sense in among these people that only a foreigner could have dared to fly in the parson's face so i waited long enough to catch the turn of the public feeling and finding it set hard against me my foremost thought was the love of home keeping this in view and being pressed almost beyond bearing now with no certainty moreover as to warrants coming out and the people looking strangely every time they met me i could have no peace until i saw the beautiful young lady and to her told everything you should have seen her eyes and cheeks as well as the way her heart went and the pride with which she gathered all her meaning up to speak even after i had told her how the ricks would burn themselves you dear old davy she said i never thought you had so much courage you are the very bravest man but stop did you burn the whole of them every one burned itself your ladyship i saw the ashes dying down and his summer-house as well took fire through the mischief of the wind and all his winter stock of wood and his tool-house and his any more any more oh david yes your ladyship his cow-house after the cows were all set free and his new cart shed fifty feet long also his carpenter's shop and his cider-press you are the very best man she answered with her beautiful eyes full upon me that i have seen since i was a child i must think what to do for you did you burn anything more old davy the fire did your ladyship three large barns and a thing they call a linhay also the granary and the meal-house and the apple-room and the churn-room 
and only missed the dairy by a little nasty slant of wind what a good thing you have done there is scarcely any man i know that would have shown such courage mr llewellyn is there anything in my power to do for you nothing could have pleased me more than to find this fair young lady rejoicing in this generous manner at the parson's misadventure and her delight in the contemplation made me almost feel repentance at the delicate forbearance of the flames from the rectory itself but i could not help reflecting how intense and bitter must be this young harmless creature's wrong received and dwelling in her mind ere she could find pleasure from wild havoc and destruction there is one thing you can do i answered very humbly and it is my only chance to escape from misconstruction i never thought at my time of life to begin life so again but i am now a homeless man burned out of my last refuge and with none to care for me perhaps i may be taken up to-morrow or the next day and with such a man against me it must end in hanging i never heard such a thing she said he tries to burn you in your bed after blowing you up and doing his very best to drown you and then you are to be hanged because there is a bonfire on his premises it is impossible mr llewellyn to think twice of such a thing your ladyship may be right i answered and in the case of someone else reasoning would convince me but if i even stop to think twice it will lead to handcuffs and handcuffs lead to halter at this she began to be frightened much and her fright grew worse as i described the unpleasantness of hanging how i had helped myself to run up nine good men at the yard-arm and a fine thing for their souls no doubt to stop them from more mischief and let them go up while the lord might think that other men had injured them your ladyship i began again when i saw all her delicate colour ebbing it is not for a poor hunted man to dare to beg a favour oh yes it is it is she cried that is the very time to do it anything in my power david after all you have done for me then all that i want of your ladyship is to get me rated aboard of captain drake bampfylde's ship she coloured up so clearly that i was compelled to look away and then she said how do you know i mean who can have told you that but are you not too perhaps a little too old your ladyship not a day i am worth half a dozen of those young chips who have got no bones to their legs yet and as for shooting if his honour wants a man to train a cannon i can hit a marlin spike with a round shot at a mile and a half as soon as i learn the windage for i knew by this time that captain bampfylde's ship the alcestis was in reserve as a feeder for the royal navy to catch young hands and train them to some knowledge of sea life and smartness and the styles of gunnery and who could teach them these things better than a veteran like me miss carey smiled at my conceit as perhaps she considered it well davy if you can fire a gun as well as you can a hayrick no more your ladyship i beseech you even walls like these have ears and every time i see my shadow i take it for a constable i am sure there are two men after me have you then two shadows she asked in her peculiar pleasant way at any rate no one will dare to meddle with you or any of us i should hope in the general's own house come in here i expect or at least i think there is some prospect of a boat from the alcestis coming up the river this very evening perhaps you have some baggage no your ladyship not a bit they burn me out of all of it but i save some money kindly by special grace of god at the loss of all my leg hair i ought not to have said that i knew directly after uttering it to a young lady who could not yet be up to things of that kind End of chapter forty